All right, would you like to uh, introduce yourself first to us? Um, I'm Oscar Fernandez, and um, I taught here for 15 years, um, and I was the program uh, coordinator for the graphic or communication design program for 10 years. And um, uh, presently I live in, in Columbus, um, but um, have very many, many fond memories as I was driving down here wow, okay. for this interview. So, uh, what questions do you have for me? Where do you want me um, to begin? Maybe start out with uh, like when did you come to UC and like what brought you here to the campus? Well, I was thinking, I know how did I discover or how did I learn about UC? Um, it's kind of funny. I'd have to go back all the way to 1974. Um, I was this, uh, just started my graduate, first year graduate program at Yale University for graphic design. Mm -hmm. And my first year class, there were 15 students uh, for that first year. And each one came from a different institution, a very reputable one, uh, some a very small school. Um, I was the only uh, art major uh, in the group because Yale had this uh, desire to have a very diversified educational background. So for graphic design, there was someone from physics, someone English major, someone who was a a uh, geologist, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I was the only art one. And they all came from different schools, except for two students. Both came from the University of Cincinnati. And I remember I was all, that impressed me. Wow, two, not one, but two came from the University of Cincinnati. And, um, and these two, um, Mark Eberhardt and Paula Hoffman, um, I started learning about UC from them uh, through, you know, wonderful stories they'd tell me about their, their professors and the school and the city. And, uh, and I recalled often, uh, you know, how enamored I was at the kind of design solutions they would develop. They were good, both of them. And, I, and the reputation of that design program, and of course it, it extends out to the whole university, uh, always stayed with me. So it started becoming like this, uh, you know, somewhere they're in that top 10. I don't know a document that supports it, but I know they've got to be in that top 10 somewhere. So that always uh, would continue in my early career like that. Um, and in a way, maybe I remember uh, Mark would draw some sketches in his uh, book, sketchbook, uh, some caricatures of his teachers. And they were really well done because, you know, it was just amazing that when, when I finally did come here, uh, I encountered them. I said, wow, you look just like your caricature back 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, so yeah, the University of Cincinnati was always on my radar uh, as a good school and a good, uh, excellent design program. And it became the kind of, uh, not so much a goal that I wanted to be there, but it was like the beacon. It was like the uh, place uh, that uh, set standards and uh, really rigorous uh, education took place there. Um, and then in, uh, I would, when I moved back, or I moved to Columbus, I was living in Texas at the time, but when I moved to Columbus, eventually I started teaching at Ohio State. And I would frequently come down and visit because they would have wonderful lectures. And I started uh, knowing these people that I'd always seen in, in the little caricature sketchbooks uh, live. Uh, got to know them. Uh, one in particular, Gordon Salko, who uh, in a way founded the graphic design program in the late 60s, 67, 68. 
And um, uh, I got to teach as an adjunct for a full year uh, to replace someone who was on sabbatical, a woman named Ann Gory Goodman. And, um, and there, lo and behold, I'm there part of the faculty uh, of the UC graphic design program. And, um, and that whole year got me to um, be introduced, uh, learn more that it's not just the graphic design program, it's the whole University of Cincinnati. Uh, the, the black and red I would you know, start seeing often and, uh, and what about the school? But anyway, it just gave me an inside look as to how the not only the program operated but the whole university the culture mm -hmm. uh, there was always that energy that seemed to exist to uh, pursue excellence uh, but have fun at the same time um, it was very uh, uh, very diversified uh, collection of people, not only in the faculty, but in the students, and, uh, and I enjoyed that. And, um, uh, but yeah, the, so the expectations of walking in, or seeing a, a house for sale on, on the web nowadays, and you go, wow, that's really nice, and then when you do go and visit, all the expectations are met. And that's what it was for me, you know, just as a, when did I first start knowing about UC? Yeah, nice. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so, uh, next, what did you hope like your students took away from your classes when you taught here? What, what was that, JJ? Uh, what did you hope your students took away from your classes when you took taught Took away here? from yes. my classes? Mm -hmm. um, well, one thing about me when, in teaching, um, I have both a good uh, many years professional practice as well as teaching, but I wanted to teach always because I'm one of those to give it back. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had some incredible uh, teachers and mentors that um, really it's about developing yourself and finding your skill sets, your knowledge, your expertise and using it to uh, make a difference in the world and to give that uh, commitment hopefully it will be adopted by your students one thing about me that you need to know uh, that because it does relate to your question about to students take away uh, is how much your your life will impact your early life your, your things unexpected will really shape not only who you are, but it'll also uh, direct you to what you become. And how events that occurred in your life early, uh, you won't realize that um, how they'll reemerge and really make uh, an important impact on what you do with the everything that you work on, every project. To back up all the way, I'm from Cuba originally. Uh, I came to America. I was <laughs> in the hot political buttons today, uh, an immigrant. Uh, but I remember the difficulty of not being accepted at first. Um, I was. I remember my mother dressing me up for the first day of grade school, first grade, and this is in Hoboken, New Jersey kind of rough neighborhoods and all that, and my mom didn't realize Americans are very informal. But if I have this old picture somewhere, but I'm going to describe it. I was wearing a suit, a tie, a coat, and even an attache little bag for a kid. And here I'm going to this real rough school, uh, the Catholic school, St. Peter's and Falls. And um, uh, it was a place where a lot of longshoremen worked and their families, they worked in the docks, and so here comes this kid, doesn't speak English, coming up with this little satchel and his bag and suit and all that. Anyway, it started 
to set in motion my desire to always communicate, always be understood, that people comprehend me. Uh, communication became very important for me. Uh, and so from there on, I didn't realize that many years later, when I was trying to decide what exactly I was going to do with my design, was to create uh, communications for other people to understand data, to understand abstract concepts, uh, how to uh, communicate in bilingual, trilingual ways. Um, and, but to, for the students to realize, my students in my field, that we're communicators, that we have this incredible privilege uh, I just wrote an essay on it. I called it the, the quiet conservator. That that's what we are as graphic designers, quiet conservators. Conservators of the, probably the greatest invention humankind ever came up with was writing. You know, all that that's on your paper. We take it for so, so much for granted, but when you think about it, it is an amazing invention that those little marks that are on that page convey sound phonetic sounds and it's incredible flexibility and resilient but uh, so that's what I tell my students when they walk away with do you realize how what an honor you guys have that you get to handle this uh, invention this greatest invention of mankind humankind and um, and that you can do something with your abilities you when you know how it's working how it uh, operates, how it functions, and uh, that you can make a difference in someone's life, not in masses, but in very incremental ways. Just someone able to read instructions on how to put together a device or how to find their way on a map or whatever, but uh, that they have a lot of uh, amazing power for good. So that's what I like to get my students to walk away with. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, next, uh, you said that when you came here, you like heard of uh, UC through those two students, and then through them, it just kind of like opened your eyes. And then, uh, can you talk about like your hiring process and like what they did to hire you here? Uh, let me see. So this would have been in 2003. Uh, well, the hiring process would go uh, as usual. Uh, you generate a number of candidates. This I know real well because I was, a, in a way, an administrator and I know all the workings. Uh, but you make sure what you need, uh, what expertise you need for the curriculum. You have to post it um, on a number of uh, publications and, and nowadays on the internet. It was still in its infancy then. And um, you first have, uh, you know, people review the, the documentation, the uh, uh, resumes, a portfolio, uh, your publishing work, and then they will narrow it down to people that are going to have a phone interview about seeing the person, whether he's got, uh, he didn't shave correctly or nothing, uh, that's not known, but just to hear this person and how they respond to a whole set of questions uh, like you're doing right now. And even though I knew the people that were here, I'd always, um, admired them and uh, was very excited and nervous. Um, it was a tough interview. You know, they asked good questions, but they were very challenging ones, ones that intellectually you really had to go uh, to quite a depth uh, to answer correctly. And, you know, um, so they would have these mysterious people. I mean, I know who they were, some of them I did, but then you hear these voices coming on the other end of the phone asking you this question and then asking that question. And uh, what would you do if this happened in the class?
classroom. And what are your feelings about this article that was written by so and so? And uh, so, you know, a little sweating there that took place. And, uh, and then they said, you know, after about an hour or so, that ends. And they said, well, we'll call you back, let you know, thank you for your time. And then you get that call from the search committee chair. Uh, her name was McChrystal Wood at the time. And uh, to tell, inform you that you've now made the next round to come on campus to interview. And now you have to get to prepare a whole presentation. Uh, a presentation given to uh, an audience of students, uh, faculty, um, and it's open to the public. And boy, how do I prepare? What do they want to hear? You know, you want to make sure you can speak uh, to that audience. Uh, but yet you have students who just entered the program and they don't have any idea what design is. Uh, and yet you have faculty and professional practitioners from the city who are going to be there. So how do you, with these extreme levels, how do you make a presentation? Uh, and you have many meetings, uh, first with the dean, then you have one with the school director. Then you have one with the faculty of that program, usually a lunch, and then you have one with the students. So it's a long uh, marathon day of just questions and the same questions are asked and you have to come up with the right answers. And, uh, and then you finish it with the search committee, usually in this room. In fact, it probably took place in this room. Yeah, and uh, it's called the exit uh, interview. Um, so the presentations, uh, you walk it through, uh, you have about an hour, you know, how do you eat up an hour uh, time, how do you address things, uh, you go back to the job description, what are they exactly looking for, uh, how do you give some facts about yourself, uh, some little nuggets, I call them, that they can help remember you uh, more in a positive way. Um, I remember the theme I was using, I still think of myself as a foreigner, even though I don't have an accent anymore or whatever, but I still think I'm not in a very uh, detrimental way that I'm an outsider, but I just know that difference, that I still have that. But I use it to my advantage because as a designer, we design for other people. We design for uh, people that might not think like us, uh, don't have our education level, don't have our skill sets. Uh, but I always try to bear that in mind on any new problem I have to solve. How does it experience for the first time? Like a good designer will tell you if they're designing for the web or an interaction device or for a map or whatever, you always design for the novice the first timer. You don't design for the full expert because the expert will, obstacles forget it, they just plow through it. But we always design for the novice or the intermediary person. Uh, and so having that memory I had when I couldn't speak English or whatever, that sense of uh, inability, uh, of not being involved, I always keep that in mind. And that's always helped, I think, make me a better designer. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So you said that you, uh, you're in administration? Hello? Well, I was. I uh, think you when you're a program coordinator, uh -huh. it, it is an administrative role. Uh, okay. You know, you have to be involved in hiring, uh, you have mm -hmm. involved in scheduling. Yeah. So even though technically they don't have it as administrator, but I'm mm -hmm. you know, wearing many, uh, several hats. Okay, so um, just to go on with that question, like, how did you feel about and interact with the administration? Well, for the, I can't speak for every, you know, all the departments throughout the campus, all the units, mm -hmm. but I know with us, um, it was a very, uh, one of uh, always mutual respect. 
um, always uh, very accessible, the administration was, uh, always willing to be supportive, um, because many times I had already known them years before uh, as professional colleagues mm -hmm. or as fellow educators. Uh, and then as they advanced and, and became more senior and finally uh, full administrative roles as director and dean, um, one thing I always remember uh, was the, on a consistent basis, was support for any ideas that you have, any proposals. They might not happen because of budgetary limitations, but there was always 100% support uh, for any new idea you were proposing, something, you know, your new course content you were proposing, uh, a new teaching methodology you wanted to introduce, uh, you wanted to create an event. I never, ever heard the word no. You know, mm -hmm. but that's ludicrous. That's a stupid idea. Uh-uh, 100%. Okay, let's figure out how we're going to do it. Um, and I think it's because they were themselves at, at that, you know, at some time, a junior faculty, senior faculty member mm -hmm. who also wanted to uh, make a difference, not only with the students, but uh, with society and the university community as a whole. Yeah. So it was very uh, congenial, it was very amiable, all of them were, um, and very receptive, um, doors always open type thing. Yeah, I never saw any barriers. Wow, that's good. So, um, so you were here 15 years, I think? Yes, almost 15 years. 15 years. Did you, like, what changes did you, like, witness at UC? Well, time. the biggest one was the going to semesters. Oh, really? Yeah. I remember at the time when, oh my God, people who, see, before I had taught already at other schools, the Carnegie Mellon, I taught at Ohio, uh, not Ohio State, they had quarters too, mm -hmm. uh, Montana State. I was used to semesters. And, and then when I came here to UC and everything was 10 week quarters, and my God, I felt they were so fast. They, I mean, you either, before you know it, the course is done, and you know you got to get people to submit work and get work done. But I remember the UC community, Bearcat Nation, was concerned about, oh my God, it's going to be the end of the world. We're, we're, we're no more quarters. We're switching to semesters. What's going to happen? And uh, and I remember all these uh, meetings took place, uh, brainstorm sessions, transition meetings. How are we going to take all these courses? Some had to be combined, others had to stay, but then we had to add five more weeks. How are we going to do it? Teachers were scratching their heads. How am I going to add more course content? Um, but the sun came up. We were now semesters. Um, that course content you had, I remember towards the end, <laughs> they were even saying, oh my God, I don't have enough time in these 15 weeks. I need <laughs> more. But that was huge. That was a big uh, event, and I was here for part of that history to switch from quarters to semesters. Um, do you know how why quarters existed? No. In fact, it started at Ohio State. Okay. If quarters were in were, I don't know the actual workings of it, but as it was told to me, quarters were created. These short academic terms of ten weeks was after the Second World War, as the Ameri as GIs started coming back. Uh, they wanted to get these people back in the workforce to get their degrees. So it was a, seen as an accelerated way to get all these uh, former GIs and all that, men and women, back into the workforce with degree programs and with the proper training. So that was the 10-week uh, quarters that was created. Um, but yeah, I remember, oh, there were people just scared to death, people who were students and then taught here at UC. I mean, quarters was like, that's so set in stone. It was like a, an architecture, but no. Um, other changes, the technology changes, of course, were dramatic. I mean, just in that short amount of time, 15 years sounds like a long time, but it, there were a lot of developments. Uh, 
and um, sizes that grew, uh, but not the caliber of the students. That's one thing, you know, I could compare Ohio's, all my Ohio State friends, I don't mean anything by it, but I could tell the caliber of the students at UC were just a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. uh, the admission standards were just a little bit higher. And, um, and I always noticed that. Uh, from the first days I was here, you know, the type of questions I would ask, the inquiries from students, uh, credible work ethics always. Uh, I, would I was always hoping for a class that I'd call my Nike class, because they were students that just did it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, no complaints, they just did it. And um, they reminded me a lot, because I did mention Montana State, I, taught in, that's where I started teaching, in 79-80, and this is in Bozeman, Montana, and I had students that came from towns of no more than 200 population. Some had never even seen a big city, and but they had incredible work ethic, because a lot of them came from farms, and they knew to get to a certain goal, we had to put in a lot of work. So they reminded me, in fact, I remember kidding some of the UC students. I said, uh, you must be from a farm. They said, why are you saying that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw a lot of changes in um, how different academic programs had to adjust curriculums as new knowledge was being added and expanded. Uh, not only new technical skills, but just the body of knowledge was growing. Mm -hmm. And so how do you accommodate that? I saw a lot of curriculums, like even within the one here, uh, courses that used to be so foundational uh, finally had become too specialized. Uh, curriculums were becoming more of a generalist approach, especially in the undergraduate levels, and that's something that's going on now, been going on for quite some time. Um, what other changes? The diversification never changed. In fact, we used to, uh, our director at the time, Robert Probst, who would eventually become our dean, he'd always call us the, the, the UN college because we always were uh, real rich with different perspectives and that's something I've always uh, enjoyed and I needed always to thrive in it with my kind of work, design work. Uh, it mirrored real well the uh, outside in the professional community. Um, because I always like working with teams of people from different specialties, different areas. You know, I'd work on a project with a child psychologist, an engineer, um, a uh, IT person, uh, a, a writer. Uh, I mean, I just love those different perspectives. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so. Have you seen like UC's priority like shift as like a whole campus since you've been here? Not so much priorities, but I've always seen it uh, very welcoming, very eagerly wanting to accommodate. Uh, the new technologies and trying to find often synergy between different disciplines. Uh, you know, really mirroring the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the field, the professional field, the community, because the type of problems that exist today in society are so complex, uh, one discipline alone can't solve it all. Mm -hmm. And I think UC was always very uh, uh, strong advocate for that, that was always encouraged. I mean, their uh, uh, research grant programs they would provide undergraduates always stipulated an interdisciplinary grant, forcing, uh, I don't want to say forcing, but really encouraging faculty to, you know, walk across campus, go to the medical school, go to the uh, business school, go to the marketing, go in, the, you know, see if there's some possible collaboration and that's something that I remember from when I first arrived 2003 the university was always a, 
uh, a strong advocate for that. So going on to kind of uh, similar, um, mm -hmm. where do you like see UC going in the future? Where do I see them going? Hmm. I don't have an answer. It's just a big question. Yeah. Because there's so many things could happen. Um, I think the universe, I mean, one spirit or quality or attribute, whatever you want to call it, was this incredible high sense of optimism mm -hmm. um, that's always existed. I never seen that ever being on decline. Uh, um, I think we're, the university uh, will start because of this encouragement of interdisciplinary education that there's going to be creations of new disciplines that don't even have names yet that I think they're going to be born right here on this campus. Uh, some mergers are going to take place, some evolution, some morphing uh, of different uh, knowledge bases are going to start taking place. I think they already have. Um, I think the uh, yeah wow that's a big question. It's an exciting one, but I'm trying to think of how best to put it. Um, I think the university has always seen uh, attuned uh, to social issues that have gone on. Um, they do you know, ardent supporters for uh, a community of humankind uh, with all its tapestry, rich tapestry that it has and it wants to continue that. Uh, it doesn't want to ever exclude, it's always been inclusive since the day one. Uh, that's something that my former classmates Paula and Mark way back at Yale uh, would share that with me uh, because they came from different diverse backgrounds. Um, whatever it is, I'll just say it, I won't be surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's never been, I mean, you hear the University of Cincinnati, you know, technically as it started, used to be a city university. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's ever seen themselves as um, uh, ever been locked into just within a city. It mm -hmm. just goes by name. I mean, it's really a university of the world. Yeah. It's what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's Bearcats all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, even in Antarctica. You know, they probably need a coat, but... Um, and I think that's what the university's always proposed is, I mean, you know, we have uh, amazing, dynamic problem solvers that we produce and we try to create exchanges uh, to better understand each other. Um, and we want to do it uh, with the most capable people we have. Uh, what inspired me, and I think they'll always be there, I mean, I'm using him always as an example of my consulting work. You notice my name, uh, consulting is called Bridge. Mm -hmm. I do that in honor of, um, I forgot his first name, but Strauss, who designed, engineer, helped engineer the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the UC alumni. Because I use it as an analogy for what I believe. I create bridges. I'm a bridge builder. I bridge communication. And he created this beautiful bridge that, is that from an aesthetic point of view, uh, it's intriguing, it's attractive. And yet hundreds of thousands of people cross that bridge every day, going to work, going to meet, have lunch with their loved one, going to teach some students at an elementary school on the other side of the bridge. And they might take just a hundredth of a second glance to look up at the bridge and see that beautiful red color. And that's how I like to see my designs. Mm -hmm. That, sure, I'm going to make it look attractive, 
but it's what it does. Mm -hmm. It's what it can do, how it performs. And, um, uh, and that's one thing that you know, the university gave me role models like that. And um, how to explain what I want to do in design. So that we take care of the big question. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so talking about uh, like that bridge mm -hmm. that you're talking about, like what would you say would be your most proud accomplishment, like at UC? Oh my God! Uh, there's so many. And that's something the university made it possible. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the largest ones that I touched on uh, in 2010, we completed, um, myself and four other teachers from four other schools, uh, that we were involved in this national design initiative supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they are. Uh, strong supporters of medical, improving medical literacy. And myself and the three other teachers at other schools were part of this school consortium to work on uh, this national design initiative to help people uh, who are LEPs, it stands for Limited English Proficiency, because a growing problem, and it still exists today, that uh, there are thousands, approaching the millions of people who English is their second language. Some, they still can't uh, speak English. And yet, uh, healthcare facilities around the country uh, have these huge issues. How do they communicate? You know, how do we help wayfind someone to get to their radiology test and they don't speak English. Um, they can't create eight different signs in eight different languages, it's just not feasible. Yeah. So it's always been known through research and uh, studies that have been done that symbols, universal symbols as the term, uh, can break through those barriers. So this was part of a project, National Design Initiative, to develop a set standard of symbols that would be uh, placed in hospitals to help people that are in these different language groups. And uh, it was a project that had been ongoing, but this was the second phase of students from these, and maybe after the interview I can show you and you have mm -hmm. a reference, and I can send you a PDF later. Okay. Uh, you can see uh, we developed 50, universal symbols for students to be used in public domain hospitals. You know, the children's here uses them right now. Uh, these were all user tested in a very scientific method ways. Um, we were using a research method by this uh, Austrian fellow and um, how to have data enough and a uh, enough of a percentage of results that this is working to uh, qualify it and then at the end of these two years 50 standardized symbols were produced and created and it's now in the public domain and of those 50, 17 came from uh, UC students. The basis of them came from there and so it's very relevant to me because at the beginning I said I didn't know any English at all. Mm -hmm. And that here I came to this university and the university, through my association with it, uh, we got introduced to this program, this proposal. We applied for it. We became part of this consortium. It was on NPR radio, this work that we did. So here I was not only giving back to students, but also giving back to people that are at this moment right now are trying to find their way for a dialysis session and their uh, daughter dropped them off but he can't speak uh, English and get their way. And the students themselves, when we were going through that process, uh, I remember the many uh, 
iterations we created, the many testings. We had graduate students from here who came from different parts of the world, you know. Uh, and they provided a great perspective saying, no, for you guys, you understand in the States, but for us, this means this. Um, real quick example, like for the symbol for alternate uh, health care. There was a symbol of acupuncture and all that. And I remember the Asian students were, t the graduate students were saying, well, for us, that's not alternate health care. You know, that's a very integral part of their uh, medical treatments in Asia, acupuncture. So it got a lot of other students to think twice, wow, they never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you connect? How do you create these bridges? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, the, that, along with many others, I was very proud of doing that. And, uh, and I still get emails from the, some of those student participants, how much they enjoyed that project, how it made them a better designer, even though they're not working on more symbols. Yeah. But it made them think, have some empathy for people that they're working for. But yeah, it's called Hablamos Juntos in Spanish. It means we speak together. That was the name of the program. If you, I can send you a link later. I'll send it to you in the email. Okay. And you can look it up. There's all this documentation done. But Hablamos Juntos, we speak together. It started by the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but they funded the one of the California medical schools is where they started, because in California, of course, that's a big issue. And, um, but yeah, that's one of the proudest projects. And uh, even though I didn't design each the symbol, mm -hmm. but I helped advise uh, and guide many of the students, and we together as a team, I mean, I went out to Mason and all that, we conducted these surveys uh, with, um, there's a, lo a large Chinese community up there, mm -hmm. and you can see them having to figure out these symbols and do they mean this. It's a very intriguing method. They, they, the display, like you come up with five candidate symbols for mental health, okay, and you put one here in this pie chart, they're there, all five. And then they're asked a basic question. Of these five symbols, which percentage of the population, U.S. population, you think would understand that symbol as mental health? Mm -hmm. Oh, I only think 20% would get this, or only 5%, or zero. But then someone puts 82%. Mm -hmm. It had a rise medium of anything above 80%, meaning it's pretty effective. Yeah. And so we'd gather the data, and then we see why this one's very weak, why this one doesn't work. And then we do it again and test these people. So, and that's something I love because uh, in my area of graphic design, it's usually not ever tested. Or, you know, how do you know that thing's going to work? Here's the data. Here's the tests we've done. And uh, so, yeah, that was a proud moment. The Hablamos Juntos project. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So, I guess. Uh, kind of talking about like you went out and did surveys in uh, Mason about that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions is have you seen use or how have you seen UC connect to Cincinnati? You mean with the city itself? Yeah, like with the city itself. Like. I think it, uh, I've seen it a lot in the ground roots of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not on a high profile political end uh, platform, but in the grassroots. By that of having students uh, do field trips out to a technical facility, like in my area, printing facility, uh, or working on these symbols, we would go um, visit uh, the airport and, uh, and make observations, see how people uh, mm -hmm. look, you know, do kind of uh, uh, ethnographic studies, you know, like an anthropologist and watch how people uh, interact with signs and symbols. Uh, some of the senior capstone projects we do, someone would do a wayfinding uh, app for the different neighborhoods in Cincinnati. 
and here they go and they start conducting field trips the students themselves and they would tell uh, citizens uh, in the different neighborhoods what we're working on what we're trying to do uh, so they get uh, you know yeah they learn about the university but here are students trying to attempt uh, better connections mm -hmm. better ways to uh, document the heritage of each of these neighborhoods, these communities, these historic communities, how to give them an identity, uh, how to get people to start talking about their neighborhoods and all that. Uh, we did that several times um, in their communication, the graphic design programs. Um, whether doing a brand identity for uh, Oakley or Mount Adams or whatever, I remember many team of students would take one neighborhood and then try to create and, and understand the history of that community, how they get started. Oh, there were all these famous characters at one time. They'd hook up with the, the amateur historian and all this and that. And I think that's something how the I've always enjoyed and felt uh, a lot of gratification that the students, in a way, are helping create these quilt works, you know, with all the neighborhoods uh, within the city. Um, what other things that have done? Yeah, because the city uh, acts as the their backyard. I mean, it's their, uh, their scenery. It's like their landscape. It's like their national park. Mm -hmm. uh, they discover uh, and they learn the qualities of, of a place. Um, I know some of those teams when I, uh, before they would go out and they don't know anything about these neighborhoods, I'd always remark the famous um, Hawthorne book, uh, The Scarlet Letter, because at the very beginning, if you ever read that in high school, in the beginning there was the, uh, uh, the Customs House, this little kind of intro. And if you remember, he, Hawthorne made, which was a good point, I, and I told the student teams this, remember? The native will sometimes take for granted the qualities of a place, the attributes. It takes the outsider to start recognizing them and resurrecting them and making them aware again of those uh, wonderful characteristics and qualities of a place. And, and I think that's what the students did you know, as they created and formed these relationships mm -hmm. uh, with different people. So that's the way I think the university connects with the city. So maybe moving on to one of the last questions, I guess. Was there at a time that the university, like, you felt could have done stuff better or disappointed you? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't think it even needs a university. Any organization you work with, there are always going to be cases. Mm -hmm. You know, you wish they would have done a little yeah. bit more. Um, I think when you're not in the administration, you don't know all the workings that go on behind mm -hmm. the scenes, that sometimes something can be uh, possible. But um, I can never recollect a wall, mm -hmm. you know, not a wall of lack of vocal support or attempts to help make that a reality. Um, there was always maybe some financial limitations, uh, some event occurred that just impacted uh, that ever happening. But I don't remember, I don't, for me anyway, I don't ever recall a, a resistance of that kind. Uh, I think the universe, I think it's really was always up to you. Mm -hmm. You can make it possible. There was never any shackles or anything holding you back. Uh, you could go as far as you wanted to, see how far the endurance would take you. But I never recall it being a uh, any resistance. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've gone through basically all the questions. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to tell me that we haven't talked about? Um, Just the, that the highlights in, in my career, both teaching and professionally, um, that uh, 
wouldn't have been possible had I not been here and had not the university. And, uh, and I'm saying that sincerely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, my mom used to say, believe in fate. I used to think that, I used to disagree with her, but I, you know, maybe she's right. But some good opportunities came along and it was here. Uh, the Oblomos Juntos project, I mm -hmm. would have never had access to that. I would have never, you know, encountered it. And yet, there's that wonderful opportunity that uh, I got to experience and, uh, and, and make a difference. Um, and it's something that's still ongoing for, for those students that were involved and those people, as I said, that are right now in some medical facility. Uh, I'll never meet them. My students will never meet them. But, you know, it made a difference. Mm -hmm. Incrementally, you know, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that would not have happened had I not uh, come here to the university, so. All right, well, I think that's all the questions that we have. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate, I appreciate the answers. Okay. All right, so uh, we're good. Yeah, you're all good. All right.